that, but it's fun because part of, and this, this is something, Adam, why don't we go ahead and get started? Folks, we're sure. going to get started right now. Uh, and this is the way this conversation is going to flow. We are um, going to talk with you about this remarkable moment in Milwaukee history and civil rights history. Uh, and we're going to do so from the, from the uh, two perspectives. One, we want to talk about this and help offer some ideas and strategies around how to teach it. So I hope we've got some teachers on board. I see a few folks who we know are teachers, but we also hope that there are some students with us too, because we're gonna make this uh, as, as engaging of a, a lesson as we possibly can as well. And I am Robert Smith. I'm an associate professor of history at Marquette University. I direct the Center for Urban Research Teaching and Outreach uh, it's a lot of words. That's what happens when you put faculty in a room and tell them to come up with something. We uh, <laughs> come up with a bunch of <laughs> words to, to complicate things a little bit. And so um, part of what, what CURTO, the acronym, and this is quite possibly one of the worst acronyms in higher ed history, but that's okay. Uh, CURTO, uh, what we do is try to work with folks like Adam and any number of other community experts and teachers and educators around the region to do some fun stuff like retell these stories and, and broaden these narratives around Milwaukee history. And so this is the first installment of a monthly set of series, a monthly set of discussions that will make up a series, March on Milwaukee. We will take and tackle uh, important historical developments in Milwaukee's history and take a month to discuss them in this virtual world and we also want to make sure we're doing our part to be good uh, neighbors and good uh, collaborators by making sure we're offering some other online opportunities for our young people to experience some, some learning and some education. Adam, why don't you introduce yourself, buddy? Yeah, my name is Adam Carr, and I am not a faculty member anywhere, yet what I do is still a little bit complicated. Um, I'm a son of the city of Milwaukee. In my professional life, I've done work across community and doing all kinds of different communication and creative projects, public art, writing, film photography. Uh, I give tours of the city, but probably the greatest honor of my life for any project I've been able to work on was the 50th anniversary of uh, Milwaukee's open housing marches. When I entered into that, I knew just a tiny little kernel of knowledge about it and over the last few years, those kernels and many others have popped for me. And this has uh, become a really significant part of my life. So I'm, I'm just excited to dive into this with you all today. Right. Uh, we got to send out some props and some shout outs. Heather, Chris, and Keisha, thank you all so much for your work that you've done over the last several years around the commemoration of the 50th anniversary. Uh, and then also helping to move these conversations about this rich history into nooks and crannies across Milwaukee and the Southeast Wisconsin region because the, these stories deserve to be told and retold and retold over and over and over. This is how culture is transmitted. This is how we uh, create our own sense of place and affirm our place in society by making sure that not only this generation, but future generations know how important this particular story and the other stories that make up Milwaukee uh, have been both to uh, our city and state and then also our nation and really globally because of the imprint of a number of immigrant populations that have come to shape Milwaukee's landscape over the last century or more. Let's keep moving into this, the presentation. Here we go. And also some shout outs we want to give to, I mean, these, this is just a sampling of some of the principal members who have been involved in this over the last over three years now. Um, we could go on and on. Actually, this list could list literally uh, hundreds, over 100 uh, names of organizations, institutions, and individuals who have made this possible. So these are just a few of our core members who have made all of this work uh, come to life. And you know, Part of what you all heard as we were uh, getting started, uh, we wanted to send a particular shout out to the young people at the Bell Phillips School because we learned a lot about how to do this presentation from them. 
uh, they, they taught us how to be better instructors. We want to thank the staff out there for always welcoming us to come in and, and talk about this stuff with those young people. They know the city in some ways better than any of the folks we've, we've lectured to. And we've given this lecture to several dozen or more groups and entities. And as we talk about shout outs, I got to shout my colleagues out at UWM and Marquette, the folks over at UWM Library and the History Department, they really did a great job in creating an award-winning uh, archive of the open housing marches, the March on, uh, Milwaukee, uh, the March on Milwaukee um, archive is, is brilliant. Uh, it really and truly is. And then of course our folks over at the Historical Society and America's Black Holocaust Museum, Black Historical Society, thank you folks for being so important in this preservation and dissemination of history. All right, we want to go into, and now that, we're started. That concludes, that concludes the formal portion of our presentation. <laughs> yeah. From here on out, folks, we want you in the conversation with us. When we are doing this in person, we don't wait for Q&A. We never wait for Q&A. We want you to get involved in this conversation right now, immediately. We got folks in the Zoom. We've got folks on Facebook, we are paying attention. We've got Keisha in the background helping to navigate some of this stuff for us. So to begin, this is, we, we don't wait for the ending for Q&A. We get into call and response right away. And we are, of course, used to being in classrooms where people don't participate. And because we have our attendee list, we might call on some of you. <laughs> <laughs> Professor may, Rob. That's right. We may call on some of you to participate. Let's let's get warmed up. Let's get warmed up. We want you to drop some information into the chat. We want you to post to Facebook. When we talk about the civil rights movement broadly, when you've been in classrooms, when you've uh, gone to any number of lectures, answer some of these key questions for us. We're just going to take a minute or two to get your brains focused with us and then also to get some creative juices going. What are some of the key events from the civil rights movement? This is an all play. Everybody can, uh, can participate. Please do. Who were we'll some of the heroes? Go ahead, Adam. And Adam and I are going to cut Start each typing other off. in the chat. Start yeah, typing it now. Let's go, folks. We need you. We need you because this helps us do our, our right on. Mike, uh, Michelle, Ella Baker, absolutely. Freedom Rise, thank you. Places. What were the goals of the civil rights movement? Uh, when did it begin? When did it end? These are all some very important questions around teaching the civil rights movement, but they are also very important questions around research that helps to inform that instruction. You know, there, there are entire uh, schools of thought built around these fundamental questions. Rosa Parks, absolutely, Leslie, thank you very much. Keep coming with them, folks. Key events, heroes, Board, yes. Is that a start? Michelle, you think of it as a 1954 Brown? Absolutely. Father Grappi. Grappi, yep. Sit-ins. Thank you. Thank you. Voting rights. Yes. We're going to talk about a little bit of all of that as we frame and, and then get into the Milwaukee history here. So keep coming with these folks. Key events. Heroes. I like to do what they call legal history. So I like to talk about the lawyers, Thurgood Marshall, Charles Hamilton Houston, Constance Baker Motley. Tanya just said yes. <laughs> Lloyd Barbie, absolutely. I like the lawyers. But not only the lawyers, let's also keep in mind the people who had the resolve and the legal ingenuity and the legal activism to be the actual named plaintiffs in those key cases. What, what did it take for? parents to challenge school segregation? What did it take for uh, laborers to challenge Jim Crow in industry? We don't talk enough about jobs. What did it take for folks to brave attempting to, as April 7th reminded us, to brave registering and then going to vote in the face of extreme, uh, extreme uh, violence? Val Phillips, we're gonna talk about Val Phillips today, absolutely, absolutely. Any other thoughts before we move forward? Any other key people, events? Give me some places. We didn't get too many places. Give me some places. I'll throw one out. Memphis. Memphis. Sanitation Selma. worker strike. Greensboro. The borough. Yes. I used to live in North Carolina, folks. Greensboro. Absolutely. The sit-ins. 
we should say Raleigh, North Carolina, too, because of the creation of Albany. Absolutely. Raleigh was where SNCC gets jump started. Absolutely. Give us some more of Megger Evers in Alabama. Absolutely. Megger Evers. We should, we should spend a little more time talking about Megger Evers and Ella Baker, Montgomery. I'm going to, who? yes, yes. Bayard Rustin. Indeed. Indeed. Thank you, folks. This is exactly what we need because this I know. is us. Yeah, we were, we were worried we wouldn't be getting participation. It sounds like it won't be a problem. Rob's fingers are going to get sore from snapping. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know how I feel about snapping. I don't do this. 16th Viaduct. Right on, Ethan. Absolutely. 16th Street Viaduct. That's right. So we, we're, we are warming this up because the point is indeed that you can go across the country and find some very important civil rights histories, particularly here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Let's, let's get going with our other components. All right, so, so in terms of this, this question around teaching the civil rights movement and specifically for our question, teaching um, the open housing marches, part of what we like to do is frame this narrative for us. We wanna put this local struggle in the broader national and the, the, the longer historical uh, struggle around black equality and efforts to secure first class citizenship. And so there's four key points that I'll start with and the process will work. And folks, you keep dropping information into the chat. We will keep responding to them uh, as well. This is interactive. Please keep that in mind. We do better when we are moving along in this dynamic way. There's four key points that we like to start with to help us frame the civil rights movement. First and foremost, the modern civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s was a movement to change the law. Number two, it's been a long movement for black equality, which forces us to again, to again come to questions around when did it start and when did it end if it has ended. Third point, it's been a movement of local movements. Thank you, Fannie Lou Hamer, Bayard Rustin, absolutely. A movement of local movements. And I'm gonna take these four points and dig into them with a little more detail. And the fourth point, and that's, that's central to our story, youth have played a central role in social change. We can't talk about social change in the United States and not talk about the importance of young people in that process. So we're gonna take these four points, I'm gonna discuss them and add a little bit more detail to them for us, and then we'll move into a much more specific case study that is the open housing marches here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So a movement to change the law. As I mentioned before, folks, I like to study the law. I'm not a lawyer. I, I, I like to study the way uh, uh, folks use the law to effectuate social change. And one of the things that we don't do enough as teachers of the modern civil rights movement in particular, is we don't emphasize that all those remarkable movements, those movements and those protests that still resonate with us, that, that still um, play with the collective consciousness of our, our nation and memory, that, that, that brilliant moment that was the 1950s and 60s, all that marching, all that protesting was fundamentally directed at changing the law. And here's a question I'm gonna keep asking folks to participate. That law, that system, that, that, that oppressive legal system is referred to as what? What's the two words or the person's name that we often associate with that system of law that needed to be changed? Or that Jim Crow, thank you, Tanya. It, wasn't, it wasn't the man? The man or the man, we can, you know, <laughs> Jim Crow, the man, same, same dude, same dude. Um, and let me give you a couple of key ways to think about Jim Crow. Obviously, if we were to, to move back into our collective consciousness and our memory one more time, we could come up with, and feel free to drop some of this in the chat, some key components to Jim Crow. First and foremost is the system of legal segregation, Jim Crow laws themselves laws that segregated society, laws that dictated who could be where and what institutions. And while the system itself sought to separate the races uh, in terms of law and policy, we also know that that legal system was fundamentally predicated on uh, creating a social hierarchy 
that placed African Americans at the bottom of that ladder. And so it was not only a mechanism of uh, maintaining these legal structures that defined and codified human behavior. Indeed, Michelle, it's certainly legally erasing humanity. It was a, a system that was predicated on dehumanizing people uh, and making sure that socially folks would never see themselves as equal. It was not merely a question around separate but equal. We all, of course, know that separate always meant unequal. It wasn't merely a question around the law. Uh, it was also about treating humans as inhumanely as possible with the law as a veneer and a cover for those inhumane practices. Uh, and it's important for us as educators to remember that we have to introduce these ideas, especially with high school students, as early as we possibly can. We know that there are some challenges with trying to teach this to younger students. So we do have to be mindful of, uh, of what, for example, middle schoolers or younger can absorb. But certainly high schoolers need to be introduced into this more complex understanding of the modern civil rights movement primarily because it makes the whole moment in American history make so much more sense. You know, it, it fundamentally uh, allows for us to dig into a richer and deeper contextualizing of the 1950s and 60s when we shape these conversations around and through the prism of people actually making concerted efforts to change the law using the United States Constitution the 14th Amendment to do so, using as much of their own legal activism as possible to change that system. Jim Crow, fundamentally though, is predicated on legal segregation, right? It's that system of law, that body of law that we know uh, created the separation of the races. But it was also managed and maintained by wide scale disfranchisement, the removing of African Americans from the political process certainly by the 1880s and 1890s, well into the 1960s, which is why the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was so important and so critical. Jim Crow was held together through the system of disfranchising um, of the, the masses of African Americans. What were some of the ways in which Black people were disfranchised? You might want to drop some thoughts into the chat for us. Talk about some of those ways in which African Americans were denied the right to vote. Poll taxes, absolutely. Poll taxes, marriage rights, yep, tests, absolutely. Vouchers, absolutely. Poll taxes, literacy tests, grandfather clauses, if your grandfather can vote prior to the Civil War or some language of that effect, uh, you, you, you had all kinds of mechanisms. And throughout the 20th century, there were various legal challenges that sought to weaken uh, those disfranchising mechanisms, but fundamentally the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was critical. So we have legal segregation, disfranchisement, uh, economic subjugation. Jim Crow looked a lot like slavery. Folks were forced into systems that were very, very reminiscent of the era uh, that, that dominated the United States history for several hundred years, uh, chattel slavery, where uh, Southerners, black and white, black Southerners in particular for our conversation, were forced into sharecropping, forced onto the, and into the system of uh, the agricultural industry of the South that uh, exploited workers through uh, sharecropping and tenant farming. And so the, 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 the system of sharecropping, Jim Crow, in terms of its labor practices looked a lot like slavery. You had large numbers of African-American women who worked as domestics or in other capacities that uh, further confirmed a lower standing under the system of Jim Crow. And last but not least, in the event that someone was able to economically outmaneuver the limits of Jim Crow, in the event someone was able to figure out uh, all the uh, way through the quagmire that deny folks uh, access to the uh, ballot box and voting. In the event someone was able to outmaneuver Jim Crow, the system was fundamentally held together through acts of racial violence. Uh, most demonstratively, we see this occurring with lynchings, but we also see 
whole black towns and black communities destroyed as was the case in Wilmington and Tulsa. Uh, and violence not only had to be perpetrated in terms of the, the, the gruesome physical acts, but there's also other acts of violence like folks getting fired, which would ultimately impact entire families. Uh, there were other ways in which violence was used to maintain the system. So legal segregation, disfranchisement, economic subjugation, and racial violence were the, the cornerstones to Jim Crow. Fundamentally though, the modern civil rights movement of the 1950s, 60s, and 60s was designed to challenge that legal system. Let's go to the next slide. Thank you, folks. Oops. You know, as, as a historian, there's raging debates. <laughs> if you can imagine historians having raging debates. Um, when do we start this conversation of a civil rights movement? Obviously, we could start for the, for the modern civil rights movement in 1954 with Brown. Uh, Brown is oftentimes a, an important bookend because it, it, it gives civil rights activists one fundamental legal tool in their uh, tool belt, which is the system of Jim Crow had been found unconstitutional, specific to segregated education. So the question then uh, still gnaws at us a little bit. Well, we know that there were challenges and issues prior to, so 1954 can't be the, the only beginning. And so for teaching purposes, Part of what I like to do and what I've learned from others along the way is to think through the various initiation points for my, what might be considered the modern civil rights movement. And then that ultimately gets us understanding and recognizing that it's been a long movement for black equality, a long black freedom struggle that has had various upsurges around various issues in various locales at different points. And so we could begin this conversation in 1954. Obviously that makes perfect sense for the 50s and 60s that moment. We could also begin the conversation around um, the, the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s beginning somewhere right around or immediately after World War II. World War II uh, reshapes American expectations uh, both domestically and internationally. We, we come out of World War II with a different set of expectations from our government. We also have internationally a very rich set of conversations around fascism and fighting fascism. And obviously in the United States, if we're running around uh, the globe telling folks to not be fascist in other parts of the country, then African-Americans very astutely said, well, how about not being racial fascists here in our own country? Uh, so the the World War II era mobilization is also an important moment to think about what might have been an initiation point. I like to go back also into the 1920s with what we often refer to as the Harlem Renaissance, uh, the New Negro Movement. Uh, there's certainly very important uh, articulations around Black identity and what equality ought to look like that's central in the 1920s. You also have the Garvey movement in the 1920s, which helps to lay the foundation for a whole range of um, radical expressions in succeeding decades. Um, we could go uh, to the late 1880s, 1890s, when we see uh, the first major outcomes of folks migrating to different parts of the US from outside of the South and beginning to reshape various regions around the country. Indeed, Brooke, you already knew where I was headed. For my, for my own interest, I like to start the conversation about the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s in 1865. I absolutely begin our conversation in 1865 because of the 13th Amendment. What does it mean that three plus million, almost four million African Americans are no longer enslaved? Slavery uh, is no longer um, legal in the, well, I shouldn't say it that way. The institution of slavery is eradicated except as punishment for a crime. It's fun to play with the 13th Amendment. So take a peek at the 13th Amendment if you haven't had a chance to, to, to review it. I like to start uh, that conversation around the 13th Amendment with one fundamental question, is slavery against the law? It is not against the law. Uh, and the 13th Amendment says it very clearly. Uh, except as punishment for a crime. 
neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist except as punishment for a crime. The 14th Amendment is critical, right? Equal protection, due process, uh, birthright citizenship. I like to always encourage students to understand that they know the 14th Amendment, whether they can recite it or not. We understand as a nation, uh, as people, we understand some very fundamental rights of citizenship that are enshrined in the 14th Amendment. I don't know whether it's because we watch a lot of uh, law and order. I'm not sure why, but when you say the words equal protection, due process, birthright citizenship, naturalization, young people, most folks understand those ideas. Most people have some understanding of that. And of course, the 15th Amendment, uh, which uh, actually doesn't give an affirmative right to vote, but does suggest and state that voting can't be denied on account of race. So Reconstruction is critical. 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments is a constitutional revolution. And of course, we know that there is some unfinished business from America's first Reconstruction of the 1860s and 70s that then leads us into Jim Crow, but then also is uh, quite informative in terms of what occurs in the 1950s and 60s. Um, I'm not sure what just happened there. I got an interesting thing happening on my computer here, folks. So when we start the movement for black equality, whether that is 1950s and 60s or as far back as the 1860s, we could also push that conversation back to the first time an African resisted slavery. You know, we could go back as far as we want to define some beginning points. And so as we think about teaching this with our young people, give give plenty of room and latitude to think about how this movement has been indeed a long movement with various upsurges and key moments to uh, inform that process. Let's keep going. I'm, I know Adam, I gotta hurry up. Adam is, Adam is looking at me across the computer. I can't actually see him, but I'm sure he's looking at me like, hurry up, it's my turn. I got a couple I'm, more points. I'm editing out some stuff. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, next point, it's been a movement of local movements. It's tempting and it's very flirtatious to think that this was a national agenda that everybody kind of just fell in line behind and everybody who wanted to be a part of these protest communities, we, it, was a, it was a neatly shared set of expectations and values and practices. Indeed, as we know, social movements are complicated, social movements are messy, social movements are all the different words we can come up with. But what really holds this thing together is the rich, brilliant expressions of local activism. This has been a long movement, but it has been a movement of local movements. We can go across the country and we can see in any major city, in many locales, all kinds of expressions of folks working to secure just a modicum of equality and human dignity. So as much as this movement has been long, it's been wide, it's stretched across our nation. And as we move into uh, local movements, it's been deep. These, these very important issues at the local level have to be challenged by local people because they're the ones who are most astute about the realities on the ground there. And as you see here on this slide, there are some, some voices and some faces here who are sort of emblematic of the importance of local movement. Robert Williams here, uh, Ella Baker, uh, who in many respects is, is sort of the, the, the key organizer of organizers. And then of course, uh, March on Washington program, if you, if you take a peek at that, that's a, that is a rich, rich document that outlines all the folks who offer some commentary. But this has been a movement of local movements. The local has been absolutely critical. And I want to make sure to keep folks involved. We still got 28 people in on the call, Adam. That's a good sign, 30 minutes in. How about you all give us again some of those local movements just one more time. I know we, we went through some of them before, Greensboro, Albany. We should probably include Atlanta. I, there's some other southern cities that ought to be included, Nashville. Um, you got to include Detroit, particular Little Rock, absolutely, Leslie. Thank you, um, Charlotte, North Carolina. Yes, Charlotte. Um, there's a. I used to live in Charlotte. I mentioned North Carolina. There's a rich history there. Uh, Detroit, 
Revolutionary Union Movement, Chicago, uh, Cleveland, you know, uh, obviously you can go across the country and find a whole wide array of local movements that then brings together this thing we might call a long black freedom struggle, or if we stay in the 50s and 60s, the civil rights movement. Thank you folks for, for taking part. Let's go to the next slide, Adam, so I can get you into this conversation. And the last component to this that I'd like to share in terms of framing, and I think this is really critical for our young people, we have to emphasize this over and over and over. Nothing in this country of significance has changed until young people got into the mix. And that's probably a bit of an overstatement, but I think we can go with that. Young people, have played a central role in social change. You have here Diane Nash and the folks from SNCC. You have the first four young men who set in at the Woolworth counter. You have the three slain civil rights workers. Uh, you have uh, some images here on this slide that, that reminds us how young people were, uh, how young folks were in, in uh, making sure to engage the question of equality. And young people are critical for all kinds of reasons, <laughs> snapping here at home, I promise, <laughs> I appreciate it, Tanya. Um, young people are, are critical uh, for a number of reasons, but one particular reason young, young people are critical to social change is because young people are crazy. You know, young people, they, they're, they're, they're uh, brave. They, they don't have any real sense of uh, how uh, fragile life might be. And yet the young people who made up the movement in the 1950s and 60s, they learned those lessons all too seriously. They, they came to understand that they were putting their lives, they were literally putting their lives on the line to make society just a little bit better. They didn't want to wait for some version of equality down the road. Oh, really? Keisha's grandfather was a World War protester. That's awesome. Um, they, didn't, they don't want to wait for equality. You know, older folks, we'll sit down and we'll talk about it. We'll have a meeting. How many meetings have we all been sitting in the last six or eight weeks dealing with online stuff? Um, but, but young people don't want to wait. Young people want their rights today. They want what they're entitled to immediately. And, and it's a very important um, radicalizing moment when young people engage in issues. And so uh, we wanted to also highlight that you can still see the vibrant imprint of youth and youth culture, whether it's through hip hop, shouts to the Roots. Can I give props to the Roots, the legendary Roots crew? Thank you folks, I appreciate it. Um, uh, the, the impact of punk music and culture, right? The, the just recently, the March for Our Lives, the way young people demanded that the United States do something about uh, gun violence. You know, these are, are, are expressions of youth culture that have continued to play a role in pushing us in our society. They are not afraid of, that's absolutely right, Davis, they are not afraid of failing. Um, young people push agendas in ways that as we get older, we become a little more complacent and a little more cautious, understandably for any, a number of reasons, and that's not a, not, a, a, knack, a, a knock or a critique. Uh, but young people have done some remarkable things for us and they continue to do so, and particularly as we are educating our young folks, we have to remind them that we need them in all of these debates and all of these questions associated with equality. Their voice matters uh, significantly. Okay, so that is a general framing for us, right? It's been a long movement. The civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s was intended to change the law. Youth play a central role in that process. Uh, we can begin this movement whenever we find some key touch points. Uh, local movements are valuable and critical. And now what we like to do is transition us to Milwaukee. So use those four framing principles, ideas, to now help us become a little bit more informed and thoughtful about how we can understand the Milwaukee experience, the case study. Oh, absolutely, thank you. The Children's March by Zen, Zen Project. Thank you very much for that, Rebecca, that's, that's great. Folks, I hope you're seeing this chat. If you all have other um, suggestions for sources and materials, drop them in the chat for folks so folks can get those. Adam, you ready? Yeah. All right, folks, I'm gonna turn it over to Adam Carr. I'm gonna interrupt him periodically.
just because you can't give a professor an open mic and think I'm going to be quiet. Um, man, Adam, take us away. Tell us about Milwaukee. So I'm going to start with just a little personal history. I went to uh, French Immersion, Goldemeyer, Morris Middle School, and Rufus King High School, phenomenal Milwaukee public schools. And probably my least favorite topic of study during all that time was history. And I think because the way that history was taught in classrooms resemble, did not incorporate the ideas that Rob just had. I didn't hear youth in it. I, it had nothing to do with my locality. Um, the long black freedom struggle was often in, a, in the book you never got to. Um, and so for me, I wasn't that interested in history growing up. And it was only until I started learning stories locally in Milwaukee, predominantly from people and community members, that this changed my whole life. And this story of the NAACP Youth Council, of the Commandos, of Bell Phillips, of Father Grappi, I, I knew just a tiny little shred of it. And these images that you're looking at right now, so this image you're seeing right here, this is on Cesar Chavez Drive and National Avenue, where those people are standing on top of those cars, yelling racist insults. That today is a Popeye's restaurant. These images came from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. When we think of the images, the canonical iconic images of the civil rights movement, so rarely do people think of Milwaukee as a place that it happened, especially Milwaukeeans. The civil rights movement always feels like an image like this, which is dramatic and, and would capture anyone's attention. We do not think of these kinds of images as originating from our own city. So I just wanted to share a few images and this even too, the, the, the black freedom struggle in Milwaukee also influenced the brown freedom struggle in Milwaukee and activists in the late 60s and early 70s, labor activists like, like Jesus Salas and others, and they're organizing. So this wasn't just a little thing that the tendrils and the roots that have spread out from Milwaukee's open housing marches continue to this day, and particularly in that time. So we are going to start kind of at the beginning here, building off of the framing elements that Rob said, and we need to first establish the law that need to be changed. Spoiler alert, it's here in this image. But uh, after World War I, and then increasingly after World War II, Milwaukee's black population went from very low, maybe about a few thousand people, up to nearly 100,000 in the span of a really short period of time. You had droves of African-American families moving up to the north, in particular Milwaukee, for opportunity. So you had big companies, A.O. Smith, Harnish Feger. Um, you had Briggs and Stratton and the Milwaukee Railroad Shops, all these different companies. There was so much opportunity in Milwaukee. You'd hear families get down to Chicago and they'd say, keep going up to Milwaukee. You can get a job tomorrow and afford to buy a house next year. And that actually is where the law comes in. What we're seeing right now is Walnut Street. Walnut Street was the center of black business in the entire state of Wisconsin at a time when Milwaukee had the highest black business per capita in the entire country. Milwaukee had one of the wealthiest black communities in the entire country in the 60s. And I'm going to say that again because I don't think I heard that in my entire life until the last few years. Milwaukee had one of the wealthiest most prosperous black communities in the entire country in the 60s. So Wal Walnut Street demonstrates it. There was all kinds of culture happening there. There were professionals that were thriving on Walnut Street. There, were, there was a big black middle class in Milwaukee, yet here is what they ran into. Folks could afford to buy homes, but they were systematically denied the opportunity to buy homes. They were also systematically denied the opportunity to rent in any neighborhood. Milwaukee's black community was concentrated in a small part of town, and because no one could own their property, oftentimes there were slumlords who refused to make improvements or even just maintain the homes in which black people lived. This map, what you're seeing, can someone in the chat tell me, what does this show us? What is this map an illustration of? I know someone knows it just from looking at it. Absolutely. So this is housing restrictions kind of as a, as a secondary, secondary piece. It manifested in housing restrictions. This is a redlining map. So all the neighborhoods that you see that are red here are ones where insurance companies, banks, anyone creating a financial product were told not to do business because it was hazardous. 
and give me give me one guess in the chat who do you think lived in these red neighborhoods african americans for sure also milwaukee's burgeoning latino population as well and actually and it says some things like poor lower type jews in some of the comments for these maps so these are i want to point this out these documents this document it wasn't someone who was trolling on facebook saying here's who deserves money and here's who doesn't these were federal documents encoded and written into them were racism and racist policies so this is the definition of institutional racism speaking of which this is another thing does anybody know the name it actually kind of has the name or what we've come to call these things in the chat someone tell me what we call these things sundown towns yes that this is sort of a, a one of the artifacts of what what came to be sundown town so covenants that's exactly right Adam, so racially Adam, after you do after you do this restrictive covenant i'm going to talk a little bit about sundown towns for us for sure this is just one example this is one of the first examples. this is the first example in wawatosa of a racially restrictive covenant you can read it for yourself you can see there it was coding into the land that it was whites only what you're seeing here is just one example of many in the suburb of wawatosa also most of the suburbs around milwaukee had similar racially restrictive covenants so as the vehicle of American opportunity was being built, suburbs, or the idea of it. The suburbs were being built systematically in Milwaukee and around the country. Black folks were told, you cannot buy here, you do not belong here. And not just informally, it was formally put into the land. So when we talk about changing the law in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the law that was meant to be changed, you had a powerful black community who could afford to buy homes, who could afford housing stock to build their own, et cetera, et cetera, but they were being locked out of it and that caused an immense amount of frustration and consternation. Rob, Sundown Towns. You know, Sundown Towns are, yeah, thank you, Michelle. James Lowell, is that, is that the author? James Lowen, I think is the name. Uh, yep, I'm gonna put this in the chat for us. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, sundown towns are, are almost distinctly northern in their reality. I guess the whole southern region was a sundown region. But sundown towns are municipalities that either expressly in language or in practice demanded that African Americans be out of town before sundown. And if I'm going to drop a couple things in the chat. If you look at maps of sundown towns, particularly those in Wisconsin, you can just see the city of Milwaukee sort of peppered with sundown towns around the the city and the in the, the area and so as much as we talk about milwaukee being a segregated city it's also a region that has been shaped by these racialized practices not only in housing but in the way that municipalities condone a particular type of racism and racial hostility so make sure to pair restrictive covenants in that long-standing history with the broader regional expressions associated with sundown towns. I'm going to drop that info in the chat, folks. Go ahead, Adam. All right. We are now, um, I think we're at the, the good part. So we have established that in Milwaukee, there was a growing, largely quickly growing and wealthy Black community who had power, who was being frustrated. So enter i have four introductions to make for you here before we get to the actual marches the first is milwaukee's naacp youth council through the 40s and 50s this had really been kind of an honor society of young people training to be good adults be good professionals but they were watching tv reading the newspaper and seeing the civil rights movement some of the local movements that were being described previously and said you know what we have problems here in milwaukee let's do something to it so the youth council started mobilizing. They started picketing. They started protesting, organizing boycotts. They had an advisor named John Gibbons, who was a black man from Milwaukee, who served in the military, was actually stationed in France, treat really what, treated really well. And then when he moved back to Milwaukee, was disrespected again. So he saw the need to make change in his own hometown as an advisor. He was taking the will of the youth council and saying, you know what, let's do this. 
the changes that you guys want, we should make them. 1965, um, they got a second advisor who's pictured in this image. So what I wanna show you all, or what I wanna ask you all to do right now is in the chat, this is a lightning round, we don't have a ton of time right now, is tell us some of the who, what, why, when, where, how of this picture. So what are you seeing? And let's start with who. So just share, who are you seeing? Um, what age, et cetera. All right, we see young people. Give me, give me a little bit more on that. You see uh, Father Grappi. Okay, we already got at the rave. That's Nic Niccolo Adorado there. How old do you think those young people are? Give me some specific age guesses. 14, 16, late teens, high school. That is probably exactly right. A lot of the youth council members were in high school and middle school and actually even in grade school. So that young man standing in front, if you work in high school, that probably sound, looks exactly like one of the students might be sitting in one of your desks. You can see he's holding that NAACP Youth Council picture. What do you think they're there protesting? What is the protest about? Anybody got it? They're at, it's been whites only, there you go. Can anybody then, okay, all the All White Eagles Club, they weren't allowed in. Can anybody now make for us, make the connection here, looking at the marquee of the Eagles Club and that policy and see the huge glaring irony? Absolutely. So people are seeing Duke Ellington, the black performers. Duke Ellington and his big band could not buy tickets to their own show if they had family in Milwaukee, cousins, because I'm sure they did actually. None of them could buy tickets to see their own show. And when they went across the street to the Ambassador Hotel where the Beatles had just stayed, chances are they would have told them, sorry, no vacancies, you gotta go stay somewhere down on Walnut Street. And then on Walnut Street, those same musicians would probably play better concerts at the clubs that we saw on Walnut Street late into the night. So what we can see here is the youth council protesting this incredible just contradiction that's, and a really important point to make is the Eagles Club had members that included politicians who were elected and judges in Milwaukee. So it was kind of this, not, not just a place where people want to be entertained, it was also a place where decisions were made, where power was built. So this is youth council and their advisor, Father Grappi, an important point to make about them, and I will make it as we move to the next image, Father Grappi saw what the Youth Council was doing with their advisor, John Gibbons, prior to him and said, you know what, I'm a fan. A lot of times people tell this story the other way. Father Grappi saw what the Youth Council had done. He'd been involved in civil rights activity down south, and he said, you know what, I love what you're doing. Let's take it further together. So tell me a little bit about what you're seeing in this picture. Can anybody give me aware, I mean, you don't need to know exactly where it is. What kind of building do you think this is? And folks, what we want to emphasize that part of what we have learned is that by giving young people the opportunity to become historians and analyzing photos and analyzing primary documents, as you all know, as educators, they, they get engaged by that. It gives them the opportunity to become a part of the historical discourse in, in very important ways. I've yet to be in a classroom where a young person, where there wasn't at least one young person who said something that I hadn't thought about, which adds to then my own approach to the classroom. Bomb shelter sign. <laughs> People are pointing out the fallout shelter sign here makes it look like a school. And then there's even someone else pointing out that it looks like a church. You're actually both right. This is out of the, uh, outside of the old St. Boniface church. They were, uh, the Catholic Church forbade the youth council from having a freedom school. So Father Grappi and the youth council protested their own home to be allowed to do what they want. I think this underscores another important point is look at these dudes. How old do you think these guys are? Eight. I would say, I mean, even younger than that. They, they're dressed like they're 50, right? Like they could be like five. Like this, this guy, look at this. The photo bombing is not new. She knows exactly what she's doing. He does not know what's happening. <laughs> so this is, this I think points to a point that Rob, Rob made in the, the, the framing that 
the youth council was really young. This was a young group of people. They were audacious. And yeah, they didn't make all the calculations of what's practical. They, they were thinking about what's right. So Father Grappi and the youth council also joined uh, Lloyd Barbie in some of the, the legal challenges he was making to school segregation and MPS. So there's, I mean, we, we got to keep moving. There's plenty we could do. We only have eight minutes. But this lady, someone in the chat, tell us who this is. This is Vel with an exclamation mark. Vel Phillips was, who had a career of first. She was the first black woman to graduate from UW Madison's law school, the first black and first female common council person in Milwaukee's common council. She went on to have a trailblazing career as a judge and until Mandela Barnes was elected in 2018, she was the only black person elected to statewide office as the secretary of state in the state of Wisconsin. So Vel, this remarkable human being, this is her at work. She took up the cause of open housing because she saw amongst her constituents people wanting to build general, generational wealth. And this is her trying to pass a bill for open housing and fair housing. Tell me a little bit. What, is it, what's, what do you read on Vel's face? What kind of emotional state do you think she's in? Somebody in the chat tell me, okay, we got frustration. Are, Are you, you kidding? kidding me? Exhaustion. Y'all don't get it. <laughs> right. You could keep going. Absolutely. Now her colleagues, take a look at her colleagues. There's a bunch of guys, this guy, this guy, this guy. Tell me what they're doing. This fella right here. Mm. We can't mm. wait. We, we can mm. wait her out. Yeah, they're good. bored, dismissive, not listening. You see everything from hostility to indifference. Rob, what do you think they're talking about in the back? Oh, those guys. guys in the back, they are planning their visit to the Eagles Club later. They heard Duke Ellington was in town. Have you heard of Duke <laughs> Ellington? <laughs> Brooke drinks. <laughs> He's yeah, they're ready to his race. <laughs> yeah, they're drinking scotch, smoking, talking about Duke Ellington. His, his big band is bully. So, Belle Phillips here looks alone. She's surrounded by hostility. A very frustrating life. This is actually, she was doing this for 10 years, bringing bills to the Common Council. Every time she brought it forward for a vote, she was defeated unanimously except for her vote. So this image is sort of symbolic of what Bill was, Bill was doing. She had people in the community who wanted to support her, but she was kind of on an island on her own. Bell did something which in retrospect is actually pretty radical, especially in the city of Milwaukee. She decided in this moment, after 10 years of struggle to get open housing passed, to reach out to the most hardcore smash mouth activists in the city. We do not see today politicians doing that very often. She reached out to these people and she said, you know what, Youth Council, I'm not going to keep doing the same thing in City Hall. We have to, to get our law changed. Our local movement will unify with you as the youth. So she reached out to the Youth Council and before we get to their marches, one last thing. I, this image is of a burning building. It's not the exact burning building I'm gonna talk about, but it's just illustrative. In 1966, the Youth Council was stirring so much up that the local, a local chapter of the KKK bombed the headquarters of Milwaukee's NAACP. When they bombed the NAACP, the Youth Council went to the police and said, you have to protect us. And the police said, if you don't want trouble, don't make trouble for yourself. You know, so the folks, Youth Council- not, I'm gonna interrupt you briefly, Adam, I'm sorry. This is not Birmingham, Alabama, also referred to as Birmingham. You know, this is, this is not the Deep South. This is in a city in the so-called North where we are going to now start to see images that we had often in, the, the, the history, the way it's taught, often only associates this kind of racial violence with Southern locales. Thanks, Adam. And I just want to point out to Renee's point that she just made. Renee, um, this, so your cousin Wayne is holding the flag. The KKK who burned down the Freedom House, those people are probably still out there alive today too. So to accompany Rob's point there, not only is this not somewhere else, this is still us. Like these, these Marquette students that you see right here walking into the Eagles Club, those people are probably still out there somewhere. So 
the commandos were formed predominantly as a security unit. And the commandos, their charge was to protect the youth council. That was their job. And as the marches went on, they went from just being the muscle to being both the brains and the brawn. Many of the commandos had served in the military. They had served in uh, Vietnam. Uh, many of them worked in factories and lost their jobs in factories for being part of the commandos. And some of them had been involved in street life. There are gangs who literally squashed their beef to take part in the commandos together. So, all right, we got all the pieces. Um, Rob, I'm just gonna say to you, we have three minutes left. Well, you know, the truth is folks, we, we have to continue because we've got to get our process together. So this is the first one. We're going to run a little bit over for those of you who have to jump out. We, yeah. we certainly understand, but Adam, we, we have to finish just so sure. that we have a complete product for folks. Right. So we're, we'll probably go another 10, 15 minutes, but this is the youth council. This is the law they wanted to change. You see the youth all over it. This is Milwaukee's local movement. And let me say this, to connect to another point Rob made, this is gonna end up being a long movement. So we are, the youth council, after picketing during the summer and actually seeing uh, the riots, which they had nothing to do with, they said Milwaukee needs marches. And on August 26, 1967, you can see here in the Milwaukee Courier, they announced their intentions to march to the South Side. At the time, the South Side was not just 100% white, it was 1,000% white. The white folks on the South Side were willing to fight to keep it white forever. And uh, we're going to do a video here. So we are going to see, uh, there's going to be a few minutes of talking, and then we're going to go into some footage that doesn't have sound, and I'll do a little narrating under it. A person's ownership of property is tied to many conditions. It is subject to deed restrictions, zoning laws, building and housing codes. I can say only one thing. Since I have every feeling this afternoon that this ordinance will be eventually defeated, you will have to face the issue of fair housing squarely and unequivocally. We march, we're gonna march if they come out or if they stay in the house, we don't care. We're gonna march. That's what's wrong, everybody's been waiting, waiting. We're not gonna wait. Well, Father, has your marches to the south side accomplished anything so far for fair housing? We're going to get fair housing not only for the city of Milwaukee, but we're going to get it on a national scene. And it's going to be this consistent type of, of courageous protest that's going to bring about fair housing legislation. Frederick Douglass talked about this a hundred years ago. He said no one ever got their rights given to them on a platter. You've got to fight for it, you've got to struggle for it, and that's what we're doing. We're protesting. There are no longer excuses for inaction or delay. Those people who come every day to St. Boniface Church, and they come from all over the country, come there with the idea that nobody is free until everybody is free and we intend to march, all of us, until we get just some of the basic freedoms that are ours. If ever a matter, if ever a matter demanded the urgent attention and forthright action of this common council, this is it. Gentlemen, the time is now. Thank you. August 28th of 1967 is the first march. About 125 people started North Division High School at St. Boniface. They went down the 16th Street Viaduct, met by another 125. 250 protesters, this is a youth council, went across the 16th Street Viaduct and this is what happened. I'm gonna pause just for one second if I can. Nope, I'm not. So they were met by upwards of 8,000 angry white counter protesters. I've been told not to say angry white Southsiders because people came from all over the place to join them. They made it that night, they went down 16th Street, marched into that tidal wave of hatred, made it to Kosciuszko Park, 
went to a picnic area that they had the foresight to reserve, started saying a prayer, and were kicked out by a park commissioner because they had it reserved for a picnic and not a prayer. Went back home that night. The second day, I don't know about you all, talk about audacity. They said, let's go back for a second day. There were 500 marchers the second day. This time, they were met by as many as 13,000 angry white counter-protesters yelling, throwing br brick, bricks and rocks. There is a Confederate flag in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 1967. This is where Popeyes is today. People expressing outwardly hate, outwardly. Those signs are professionally printed. I want to point that out. There was money in organizing behind the white counter-protesters. There were people you're going to see here in a moment. They have on this car printed white power. That is a commitment. So another Confederate flag. Youth Council this time did not linger at Kosciuszko Park. They made it back home. And when they got to the 15th Street Freedom House, which was their headquarters, this is what they found. The police claimed that there had been a sniper on the roof. They shot a tear gas canister in and set the house on fire. The Freedom House burned. This is the next day. The mayor said there shall be no more marches. The youth council canceled their march officially, got together at the Freedom House. When they stepped off of the lawn and onto the sidewalk, the police declared them unlawful and arrested them. There were a bunch of people arrested that day. When the youth council said, you know what? If they're going to arrest us just for rallying, we might as well march. And on the fourth day, they planned to march down to City Hall. They made it only a couple blocks before hundreds of youth council members, or hundreds, uh, over 100 people were arrested, included many children. I've heard stories from the marchers themselves saying the adults were really worried about the kids, but they could hear them down the hall singing songs in their cell. So they marched the next day and the next day in the face of, so when the white counter protesters came out, the mayor was offered the services of the National Guard to contain them because they were out of control. It was a white riot. The mayor of Milwaukee, Mayor Meyer, said, no, it's fine. Many of the police officers were protecting the marchers from their own friends and family. That man in the white hat that you see is Dick Gregory. He's a comedian that joined up with the youth council. I think he had a, a cousin in the commandos and about a couple weeks in, he started joining the marches. There he is at the front. He also started strategizing with them as well. He was, uh, uh, you can see the Community Custard Center. That's where Tasty Twist is on Titonia today. Um, so Dick Gregory helped lead marches. And actually, they had their largest march of about 5,000, about two weeks into the marches. So they kept marching all over the city. You can see they marched on Lincoln. They marched on Mitchell Street. They marched on the north side. They marched out to Tosa. They marched all over the place. They marched every day in September, every day in October. They marched every day in November. And I'm actually going to move now into some images. They marched. They said they're going to march forever. Here are some images of them. This is them on the 16th Street Viaduct. You can see Marquette University in the background. You can see who the authors of this story are. Um, I want to tell you, the vast majority of the authors of this story, as you can see from this image, are young African-American people putting their life on the lines. They marched all over the place. They kept their spirits high. One of the questions I've returned to over and over to the youth council members that are still around today, I've said, how did you keep going? And they said that they had each other. A lot of them, really the family they had were the other protesters. The youth council became really a family. They relied on each other, they needed each other, and they fought with each other, but they kept it in the house. So I wanna point out, you can see here, a man with a gas mask on his head and a rifle marching somewhere down here on the south side. This looks a lot like him right here, maybe not exactly, but that is this, right after this one, this is the Freedom House burning down. Um, there's some incredibly dramatic, images here. This is a planning meeting of the commandos. You can see, I would say, you know, sometimes, a lot of times the story gets consolidated to Father Grappi. I think he would have a strong distaste and be spinning in his grave if he knew he had oftentimes been isolated as the figurehead of the movement because so many other people were involved in it. The commandos here, you can see most of the seats at the table here are occupied by the commandos. As the marches went on, Father Grappi was tugged into other national kind of conversations. Back home, the commandos held it down. Um, 
actually, this is Rob. Do you want to talk about this image for? Yeah, a minute? this is this is of all the images, and I, I again, we're, we're encouraging uh, folks to give our students the opportunity to do these image analyses. I know that you all have a number of these kinds of uh, lessons and rubrics in, in in place already, but this image to me, uh, it, it it embraces the tension of the moment. It it visually sort of gives us uh, some impending uh, crises that are emerging. You see the, the stance of the NAACP Youth Councils, the young men trying to uh, maintain control of their own uh, sort of physical uh, expressions, while, while at the same time being certainly fearful of what might happen. And then you have on the other side, um, a group of what we assume to be police officers, uh, about to sort of close in uh, on those young people in, in that space. I tell you that this, this, this image is, is a great example of how space teaches us or informs. That is just none but space and opportunity and you can feel all the tension right there. This is, this is my favorite photo. It, it tells us so much about the moment. Thanks, even, I mean, to draw some points here to the current moment, we see armed protesters around the country taking over Capitol buildings, white men with assault rifles, and then you see people freaking out about Colin Kaepernick taking a knee or Mike Brown being presumed to be armed and dangerous solely by being a person. So I think um, this image is, is one that resonates really, really strongly with, with the current moment. Well, um, and, it, and it also is, a, is a, again, sort of the, uh, a great example of how the theories and the ideas around protests had expanded into communities mm. beyond the South. Obviously, they are practitioners of nonviolence, while at the same time being very willing to protect themselves as needed. Absolutely. You know? I think, yeah. So um, this is the counter protesters. This street right here, you can see Forest Home Beer and Liquor Store. This is where uh, today the intersection of Cesar Chavez Drive and Forest Home, I believe. So these, um, this is a point I've heard Rob make many times, you know, these young men look like students and this looks like the teacher. And that, that is literally true in this case. You have a youth movement of hate as well as a youth movement of the NAACP Youth Council. I think it's important. One of the reasons I think this story has been lost is that this is a difficult story for white people to hear because all of us want to identify with the people on the right side of this thing but these people, much like many of the youth council um, members and commandos are still around, these signs are in someone's garage somewhere. These guys are somewhere. They have children and grandchildren. And they probably don't show them these images, but they teach them these lessons. Um, this is who they're protesting against. This is, this is the response to this. So you have, well, there's a lot of images out there, some really beautiful ones of these movements, of this movement. And really a lot of these images I had not seen until the last few years. Um, really incredible images of dramatic civil rights movement in Milwaukee. On the day that the Packers played, I actually saw in December, the marchers organized a uh, boycott of businesses hostile to African Americans. They called it Black, Black Christmas. They had their own Black Santa. Um, then on the day that the Packers played in the famous ice bowl football game, the youth council was outside marching probably for longer than the football game and burning a few more calories and wearing fur looking like Joe Namath. Um, this is a, um, telegram from the, uh, from Mar the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to Father Grappi to show his support of the marches. Overall, the youth council commandos, Father Grappi, Vel Phillips, they marched for 200 consecutive days. They eventually disbanded the marches because Vell's bill was making no more progress in the Common Council in the city of Milwaukee. They decided to join Martin Luther King's Poor People's Campaign. Martin Luther King was a huge admirer of what was happening in Milwaukee. And then only a couple weeks later, actually like barely two weeks later, Martin Luther King was shot and killed. There were responses around the country, some of which were violent, some of which were nonviolent. Milwaukee, this is the response in Milwaukee. Milwaukee saw one of the largest nonviolent responses because Milwaukee had gotten really good at marching. This is one image that people might have seen before. This is another. This is about 15,000 people 
uh, from the perspective of rhetoric, but also just from the reality of it, 15,000, this was a, a showing of strength in Milwaukee that was larger than the, sh the largest showing of hatred. There were 13,000 counter protesters on the second day. This is Milwaukee saying, here's who we are. I would uh, encourage you again to underscore the point. This was an integrated movement, but the people that put their lives on the line in the movement, oftentimes you see here a lot of young African-American people. Where are those folks, where is this uh, picture taken folks? Name the location. Someone in the chat, tell us where this is. You know where it is. You can tell, this is Milwaukee. It's somewhere in Milwaukee, right? <laughs> give you that hint. <laughs> Like, where does this look like? It still looks That's like right. it. That's right, Wisconsin yes. Ave, absolutely. So here is where the Riverside Theater is. This is where that subway is. This is um, like Planet Fitness is right here. Grand Avenue Mall right here. Yeah, so this is right downtown. And I mean, this is a point. Uh, this image showing, this is just a phenomenal image. One of the most inspiring images in the history of the city of Milwaukee. There's no, there's no marker to say this happened. There are people that stand in line here to go see uh, David Blaine or something, or, you know, go see Hootie and the Blowfish, but they have no idea that they're standing where history happened. And this specific history, not the history of a duck, dirty is fine, but what is the history? This history isn't what we memorialize. So um, Milwaukee saw this incredible um, action. And then after, after uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated in Washington, D.C., in Congress, they discussed Bell Phillips, they discussed the Youth Council, they discussed Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and they then incorporated Milwaukee's movement into the Civil Rights Act of 1968, which is called the Fair Housing Act. So, in effect, the Youth Council won, and then shortly after, Mayor Meyer, um, after the, the, the Common Council passed Bell's bill, signed her bill into law, which is more stringent. So talk about a long freedom struggle 200 days of marching, finally get their bill passed, then even longer of a struggle because those are infamous laws because of how, how resilient racism and hatred is, how resilient prejudice is. They're very, very difficult to, pass, uh, to enforce. But in effect, the Youth Council from Milwaukee, Wisconsin changed. They achieved their goal. The law was changed in our local movement. Those young people got fair housing legislation for the whole country. Just, we're going to move through some of these real quick, just as a, as a coda. Shortly thereafter, so the Youth Council and Commandos moved on to other campaigns. So did Father Grappi, so did Bell. This is the Chapman Hall takeover at UW-Milwaukee, which happened in the early 70s, when Latino students, when Mexican students went to the chancellor and said, you know what, there's no faculty, there's no programs, there's no books, there's no courses that reflect our culture. The chancellor said the same thing the MPD said and said, get out of my office. And they ended up getting out of his office for a minute. One day they snuck into his office, called their friends from his phone, and they took it over. So the Latino students at UW-Milwaukee ended up occupying the chancellor's office. They were really excited. Um, this is them looking for Spanish language texts in Goldmeyer Library, not finding any, very clever. This is them celebrating victory. Um, I can see Nick and Rob making fun of my David Blaine and Hootie references. And those were on purpose, guys. I was trying to name things that were. So, um, and that was actually, so Nick, this is your dad? Not surprised. So, um, yeah. So again, I mean, these, are, these aren't just some vestiges of the past. That's like, this is Milwaukee. Like people are still around. The children of these, these movements are still here. In some, some cases they are. This is, uh, Gabriel Riveros made, this illustration for the Long March to Freedom, which is a publication Milwaukee Neighborhood News Service made in collaboration with Curdo. Um, you know, just showing that this, these images still resonate. And then we wanted to put on here, um, so, and people ask the question, um, uh, were those the largest marches, were they the largest protests in the history of Milwaukee and Wisconsin? Actually, in last last handful of years, you have Act 10, you have the huge protests, that Voces and others, the Days Without, uh, Days Without Latinos, um, that have been organized, some huge protests in Milwaukee. And so the, the, the bridge there is that, you know, the Youth Council started this marching thing 50 years ago, and there are people in, in our own community who are still doing that to this day. Um, and actually, 
All right, we're kind of towards the end of our presentation here. Um, there are curricular resources out here to teach this. So if you're a teacher out there and you want to teach it to any level, basically, um, we have some phenomenal teachers who have been volunteering their time over the last three years to build different projects, ways to teach this. There's a ton of resources. So this is the link, the bit.ly there, uh, bit.ly slash MKE March. That is the way to, to see if you're a teacher, to see more. We can also send this out. We'll put it out on the, the Facebook as well. Um, and with that, I think we have one more image, and it's Rob's um, here. No, we have a couple other. So we're going to continue this. Um, we're, we have every Wednesday um, for the rest of the month. We're doing a different conversation. We have some really great, uh, the next one, we're going to have John Gerda and Reggie Jackson together, which I'm really excited about, two, two people I admire greatly. We have, um, we have Dr. Erica Metcalf and Patrick Jones. Um, two scholars who have done a, quite a lot of work that have helped inform what we do uh, the week after that. And we're going to get together some activists to talk about how this continues to reverberate. And then uh, we're going to listen to Wu-Tang for the month of June. Woo! <laughs> Cash <laughs> rules. <laughs> no, this uh, image came about, part of what we like to do is we've been, with young people, we've been having them create memes. We've been taking the images that we have here and asking the young people to, um, you know, be creative and think about how we can uh, make this history come alive very vibrantly in the digital world. You know, I, uh, I might be socially promoted out of some of the things most young people like, but for my <laughs> money, you know, the woo. No, yeah, we were just doing <laughs> this rules. with, we were doing this with some students at South Division right before the quarantine started. We were doing it with some students at Vell Phillips Juvenile Detention Center right before the quarantine started. And the students, we, you know, we printed out some images um, or they were just writing captions for these and they were writing really provocative stuff and not just provocative for the sake of being provocative, although some of them were. Some of them were making great connections. They were making commentary. They were connecting with it. And uh, we actually are hoping eventually to use those memes to, to create a public history campaign. So yeah, we absolutely will. Folks, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for sticking around a few minutes longer. We had to kind of work out our timing. Uh, we will make sure all of this material is available for you at um, this Facebook page. Uh, make sure to check us out. Oh, that's actually what I just dropped in the chat is the archive, inform the information on the UWM archives. Um, but certainly check us out at the Facebook page and we'll make sure to get all that information uploaded and available to you. Um, we will keep this thing going and then we'll let you know about June, July, and August. We'll have, uh, we'll keep this series going and picking some other topics. So thank you for your time today, folks. We really appreciate you.